In order to name binary ionic compounds, we need to know what two of these words mean. And the first is binary, the prefix bi referring to two, and in this case we're talking about two elements. So all of the compounds that we're going to name are going to be composed of two elements. And then ionic. Okay, an ion is a charged atom, and each charged atom has what we call an oxidation number, which is the specific positive or negative value of that charge. On your periodic table, we're going to add a few of those oxidation numbers to some groups that always have the same number. Um, above the alkali metals, you want to add a plus one. So every metal that's in group one will always have an oxidation number of a positive one anytime that they're ionically bonding. Group two is going to be plus two, same story. Then we're going to skip over to the other side of the periodic table, and group 13 will put a plus three. So that means uh, metals like aluminum always make a plus three oxidation number. Group 15, we're going to skip 14. Group 15, we're now in the non-metals, which if you recall, non-metals always the opposite of metals. So that means instead of positive oxidation numbers, they have negative oxidation numbers. So we're going to do a negative three. And then group 6A, negative 2, and group 7A, the halogens, negative 1. Hopefully you remember from previous science classes that positives and negatives attract. So an ionic compound is made when positively charged metals are attracted to negatively charged nonmetals until they neutralize each other's oxidation number. The way that works is, let's say you're given uh, two elements. So in this case, we're going to start with something you're familiar with, like sodium and chlorine. So the oxidation numbers that we just recorded, we're going to be using those over and over again to see how one metal might relate to a nonmetal. So in group one, we said everything in group one makes a plus one charge. And then the halogens where chlorine is found, everything that is in group 7A makes a negative one charge. Well, now you can see why sodium chloride works out the way that it does. If you have a plus one charge and a negative one charge, they cancel each other out and make this happy neutral substance. So the symbol for sodium bonding to chlorine is 1Na and 1Cl. The rules for naming the compound after you figured out what it is, metals always keep their name the same. So no matter what, the metal goes first, and it's always named the same name. So sodium is sodium is sodium. Then the non-metal, which is always written second, is going to change the end of its name. The very last syllable is going to change to ide instead of whatever it is on the periodic table. So rather than chlorine, we now switch it and call it chloride. So NaCl, sodium chloride. If magnesium is reacting to oxygen, okay, magnesium is in group 2, which makes a plus 2. Oxygen is in group 6A, which makes a negative 2. So once again, even though they're not 1 and 1, this is a 1 to 1 ratio. Plus 2 and negative 2 cancel each other out perfectly. So the symbol for this compound is MgO. And then we're going to say magnesium keeps its name magnesium. And instead of oxygen, we're going to change it to oxide. Aluminum bonding to phosphorus. Once again, we got to look up those oxidation numbers and figure out how they relate. So aluminum is in group 13, plus 3. Phosphorus is in group 15, minus 3. So once again, it's a 1 to 1 ratio. So the symbol for this, the chemical formula, is ALP. And that's going to be aluminum, and then we're going to change it to phosphide, and that's it. What if it isn't a one-to-one -one ratio? So this time we're going to use lithium from group 1, plus 1, and oxygen from group 6A, negative 2. So you can see that if we did LiO, Okay, we would have an overall negative one charge left over, which means that we don't have a stable molecule. They have to combine in a way that makes them electrically neutral. And the best way to do that is if we have two atoms of lithium. So if you can imagine that I'm adding another lithium with another plus one value, two plus ones and a negative two will cancel each other out. So the way we symbolize that is we're going to put an Li with a subscript two and then an O. Luckily, this does nothing to the naming rules. Even though there are two atoms of lithium, we're still going to call this compound lithium, and then we're going to finish it with oxide. All right. 
calcium and fluorine. So once again, we look up their oxidation numbers and write those down, and then we figure out what we're going to need. So based on the fact that we have a positive 2 here, and this is only negative 1, that tells me that I'm going to need another atom of fluorine with a negative 1 charge in order for me to have that neutral compound that we're looking for. So that means the symbol for this substance is going to be 1 calcium and 2 fluorines, which we turn into a subscript. Okay, naming once again stays the same for calcium, and then instead of fluorine, we're going to call this fluoride. And one last example of how to figure out what the compound is. Aluminum comes from group 3A, which is always plus 3. Sulfur comes from group 6A, which is always minus 2. So this is a little bit different because it's not as easy when there isn't a 1. But remember, we're trying to get it to be neutral. So the common multiple that 3 and 2 have is going to be a 6. And the way to make an overall plus 6 or negative 6 means that we're probably going to need to have two aluminums for that overall plus 6 value. And then we're going to need to have three sulfurs to make a negative 6, and that's the only way that these two can combine where they reach a neutral value for their charge. So the symbol for aluminum and sulfur is two aluminums, and then we would have to have three sulfurs in order to make the charges balance. Naming-wise, aluminum keeps its name, and then sulfur changes to sulfide. If you're given the name and you're asked to come up with the chemical formula, we kind of do the same process. Based on the name, you know you can find the element symbol and you can find the oxidation number by looking at the periodic table. So in this case, if I ask you to tell me the formula for potassium oxide, you want to look up potassium and you'll find it in group 1, which always has a plus 1 charge, and then you'll find oxygen in group 6, which always has a minus 2. So that means the symbol for potassium oxide is going to have to be a K2O because we need to have two Ks in order to balance out the 1O. Magnesium sulfide, so Mg, group 2A is always plus 2, sulfur always minus 2, so that means we're going to have MgS because a 2 and a 2 cancel each other out. Aluminum plus 3. Fluorine, negative 1, so that means we would have to have three ions of fluorine in order to cancel out one ion of aluminum. So we're going to have one aluminum and three fluorines. Strontium nitride, plus 2. Nitrogen is, oh sorry, strontium is SR. Nitrogen is minus 3. So once again, we're kind of doing that common multiple situation. The only way for these two numbers to work out is if we have three ions of strontium to make an overall plus 6 and two ions of nitrogen to make an overall minus 3. So that means the symbol is going to be SR3N2. Beryllium bromide, let's see. BE is in group 2. Bromine, oops left out the R, is in group 7A. So to get this one to work out, we need to have two ions of bromine to balance out the one ion of beryllium. So that's going to be BEBR2. And then lastly, we have calcium in group 2 and oxygen in group 2. And once again, if we have the same value for our charge, that means it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So the symbol for calcium oxide is CaO.